no exception. I urge all of you here this evening to make full use of the question and answer session that will happen later on tonight. With that said, I now ask you to join with me in welcoming Dr. Zakir Naik to address the society. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala Rasulillah. Wa ala ali wa sahabi ajmain. Amma abad. Awuzu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhan nasu inna khalaqnaakum min zaqin wa unsa wa jalnaakum. Shu'ubaw wa qiba ila li ta'arafu. Inna qalmaku minda Allah yatkaakum. Inna la alimun kabir. Rabbi shali sadri. Wa yisalli amri. Wa ahlul ugdata min lisani yafkaw kawli. Honorable Mr. President of the Oxford Union, Mr. James Langman, the Honorable Members of the Oxford Union, the respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. <clears throat> It's an honor and a great pleasure for me to address this historic Oxford Union. And I would like to thank the Oxford Union, especially its president, Mr. James Langman, for making this event possible. The topic of my talk today is Islam and the 21st century. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It's also derived from the Arabic word film, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. Islam, in short, means peace acquired by submitting your will to Almighty God. And any person who submits the will to Almighty God, he is called as a Muslim. Many people have a misconception that Islam is a new religion which came into existence 1400 years ago and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is the founder of this religion in fact Islam is there since time immemorial since man set foot on this earth and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is not the founder of this religion but he is the last and final messenger of Almighty God the religion of Islam is based on the teachings of the glorious Quran which came into existence 1400 years back. Is it possible that today the humanity at large in this 21st century can gain guidance how a life to be led, how a life should be led from a book which is 1400 years ago, from a book which is 14 years old, but natural. The answer obviously is no, if this book is written by a human being. But the glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of Almighty God, which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The glorious Quran is the proclamation to humanity. It is the fountain of mercy and wisdom. It's a guide to the erring. It's a warning to the heedless. It's an assurance to those in doubt. It's a solace to the suffering and it is an hope to those in despair. The glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of Almighty God which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. For any book to claim that it is a word of God, for any book to prove that it is the revelation from Almighty God, it should stand the test of time. Previously in the olden days, it was the age of miracles. The glorious Quran is the miracle of miracles. Later on came the age of literature and poetry. Muslim and non-Muslim Arabic scholars alike, they acclaim the glorious Quran to be the best Arabic literature available on the face of the earth. But today, if a religious book in a very poetic fashion says 
the world is flat. Will a modern man believe in it? But naturally the answer is no. Because today is not the age of literature and poetry. Today is the age of science and technology. So let us analyze whether the glorious Quran is compatible or incompatible with modern science. According to Oxford, according to Albert Einstein, the famous physicist and the Nobel Prize winner, who I am told also addressed this historic Oxford Union, he said, science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind. Let me remind you, the glorious Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E, -E, but it's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. It's a book of ayats, it's a book of verses. And the glorious Quran has more than 6,000 signs, 6,000 ayats, 6,000 verses, out of which more than a thousand speak about science. As far as my talk today is concerned, I will only be speaking about scientific facts. I will not be speaking about scientific hypotheses and theories, which all of us know many a times, these theories and hypotheses take U-turns. In the field of astronomy, a few decades earlier, in the 1970s, there were a group of scientists who described how the universe came into existence, for which they got the Nobel Prize. This they called as the Big Bang. And these scientists said that initially, our universe was one primary nebula. Then there was a secondary separation, there was a Big Bang, which gave rise to galaxies, the stars, the planets, the sun, as well as the earth on which we live. This they called as the Big Bang. This, what the scientists discovered about 40 years back, is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, where it says, Avalam yaral lazina kafiru. Do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. This Big Bang, which the scientists discovered recently, is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Previously, we human beings, we thought that the world was flat. It was in 1577 when Sir Francis Drake sailed around the earth that he first time proved that the earth on which we live, it is spherical in shape. The Quran mentions 1400 years ago in Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 30, Wal dhaha, and thereafter we have made the earth egg-shaped. One of the meaning of dhaha is an expanse and the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word duya, which means an egg. And today we know the earth is not completely round like a ball. It is flattened from the pole. It is geospherical in shape. And if we analyze the Arabic word dahaha, doesn't refer to a normal egg, it specifically refers to the egg of an ostrich. And if we analyze the egg of an ostrich is too geospherical in shape. Imagine the glorious Quran 1400 years ago says that the earth is geospherical in shape. Previously we did not know that the light of the moon was its own light. Previously we thought that the light of the moon was its own light. Recently we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light but it is a reflected and borrowed light. The Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, Blessed is he who has placed the constellation in the sky and placed the herin, sun, a lamp having its own light and moon having borrowed or reflected light. So the Quran describes the moonlight as borrowed or reflected, which we came to know recently in science. Recently in science means 50 years back, 100 years back, 200 years back. When I was in school, I passed my school in 1982, about 29 years back. There I'd learned in science that the sun, though it revolves, it does not, it does not rotate about its own axis. But the Quran mentions in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, it is he who has created the night and the day. The sun and the moon. Each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. The Quran says the sun and the moon, besides revolving, it also rotates about its own axis. And today, recently, a few decades earlier, science has come to know 
that the sun rotates and takes about 25 days to complete one rotation, which has been incorporated in most of the school textbooks throughout the world. There may be certain skeptics who will say, it's nothing great that the Quran speaks about astronomy since the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy. I do agree that the Arabs were advanced in the field of astronomy, but I'd like to remind them that the Arabs became advanced in the field of astronomy a few hundred years after the Quran was revealed. So it is from the Quran that the Arabs learned about astronomy and not the vice versa. In the field of hydrology, in the field of hydrology, we learn in the school about the water cycle. How does the water evaporate from the ocean, forms into clouds, moves into interior, falls down as rain, and the water will be replenished. This was first described by Sir Bernard Palissy in the year 1580. The Quran too describes the water cycle in great detail 1400 years ago. The Quran says the water evaporates from the ocean, forms into clouds, the clouds join, they move into the interior, they fall down as rain, and the water table is replenished and the water cycle is completed. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail in several places. In Surah az zumur chapter number 39, verse number 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. In Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, verse number 22. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 57. In Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 48 and 49. In Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse number 9. In Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. In Surah Jasha, chapter number 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 8 and 9. In Surah Waqiyah, chapter number 56 verse number 68 to 70. In Surah Mulk, chapter 67, verse number 30. In Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 11. I can go on and on giving references only in the Quran of the several verses which speak about the water cycle in great detail. In the field of oceanography, there's a verse in the Quran, in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 53, which says that he has led two bodies of flowing water one sweet and palatable and the other salty and bitter. Though they meet, they do not mix. There is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Previously, we human beings knew that there are two types of water, sweet and salty. But the commentator of the Quran could not understand what does God Almighty mean by saying that these two waters, when they meet, they do not mix and there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Today, after science has advanced, we have come to know that whenever one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. This today science calls as the transitional homogenizing area, which the Quran refers to as barzakh, as a barrier. And this can be seen in Cape Point, the southern most of South Africa. And when we see even the color of the water between these two types of water differs. And Professor Hay, a very famous oceanologist, he said that this information came to the human knowledge recently. This book, the Quran, it's difficult to explain how does it mention 40 years ago. In the field of biology, the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, that we have created every living thing from water. Will you not then believe? Imagine in the deserts of Arabia, the Quran says every living thing is made from water. Who could have believed in it? Today, after science has advanced, we have come to know that every living being, it contains cells. And the basic substance of cell is the cytoplasm, which contains about 80% water. Today, science tells us that every living creature contains 50 to 90% water. In the field of botany, previously we did not know that even the plants have got sexes male and female. The Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, that it is he who sends down water from the sky and with it brings diverse pairs of the word aswaj, meaning pair, saying that the 
plants have got sexes, male and female. In the field of zoology, the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 38, it is he who has made every animal that walks on the earth and every bird that flies in the air to live in communities like the human beings. Today science agrees that even the animals and the birds live in community like the human being which was not known earlier. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the bee in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 68 and 69. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle of the spider in Surah Ankabud, chapter number 29, verse number 41. The Quran speaks about the lifestyle and the communication of ants in Surah Namal, chapter number 27, verse number 17 and 18. In the field of medicine, the Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 68 and 69, that from the belly of the bee, we give you a drink of varying colors in which there is healing for mankind. It is recently we have come to know that the honey that we have is obtained from the belly of the bee. And today science agrees that there are mild antiseptic properties in honey and it is even a healing for mankind. In the field of physiology, the Quran describes the blood circulation and the production of milk in a nutshell in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 66. 600 years after the Quran was revealed, Ibn Nafis, he made it known to the world about the production of milk and blood circulation. 400 years later, that is 1000 years after the Quran was revealed, William Harvey, he made it famous to the Western world. In our textbook, we hear about William Harvey, but we hardly hear about the name of Ibn Nafis who 400 years before William Harvey spoke about the blood circulation and the production of milk. In the field of embryology, the Quran describes the various embryological stages of the human development in great detail in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 12 to 14. It says that the human we were nutfa, then we made it into an alaka, a mudga, a zaman, that human being is created from a minute quantity of fluid. Then it made it into alaka, that is a leech-like substance. Then made it into a chewed-like lump. Then made it into bones. Then clothed the bones with flesh. When this verse was showed in the early part of the 1980s to oh, Dr. Keith Moore, who at that time happened to be the highest authority in the field of anatomy and embryology, he was the head of the department of Toronto in the University of Toronto. He said that the description of the Quran is far superior to what modern embryology describes today instead of stage one, two, three. And he said that it's not possible that any human being can mention these things in the Quran. This Quran has to be the word from Almighty God and he has no objection in accepting Prophet Muhammad as the messenger of Almighty God. Time does not permit me to speak a lot about science. I'll just give one more example which is mentioned in the Quran. The Quran mentions in Surah Qiyamah, chapter number 75, verse number three and four, that when the unbelievers say that how will Almighty God be able to reconstruct our bones? After we are dead, we are buried, our bones have got disintegrated. On the day of judgment, how will Almighty God be able to reconstruct our bone? Almighty God replies in the Quran and says, tell them, Almighty God can not only reconstruct the bones, he can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of the finger. What does Quran mean by saying God can not only reconstruct the bones, he can even reconstruct in perfect order the very tips of the finger. It was in 1880 that Sir Francis Gold he discovered the fingerprinting method and he said that no two fingerprints even in millions of people identical and today this fingerprinting method is used by the police to identify the criminal, it's used by CIA, by FBI, by the police worldwide, this Quran mentions 1400 years ago. Francis Bacon, a very famous philosopher, he said, little knowledge of science makes a person an atheist, but in-depth knowledge of science makes a person a believer in God. That is the reason today scientists are not eliminating God, they are eliminating models of God. La ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah.
I started my talk by quoting a verse from the glorious Quran from Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, which says, Ya ayuhan nasu inna khalaknaku min zakin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum shu'uba wa qaba ila li ta'rafu inna kramu winda la yathkakum inna la alimun khabir, which means, O humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female, and have divided you into nations and tribes, so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Almighty God is the person who has taqwa. The criteria for judgment in the sight of Almighty God, it's not sex, it's not color, it's not wealth, it's not age, but it is taqwa, it is God consciousness, it's piety, it is righteousness. The only way one human being can be superior to the other human being is by righteousness and by piety and no other criteria. Quran says in Surah Room, chapter number 30, verse number 22. Amongst the signs, he has created the heavens and the earth and the variation in your languages and color. These are signs for the people who understand. The Quran says he has created the different variation in the color and the languages so that those who are knowledgeable people, they will know it's a sign from Almighty God. This speaks about the universal brotherhood. That Almighty God has created all the human beings from a common pair of human beings, Adam and Eve. May peace be upon them. And Almighty God says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 70, karamna bani Adama, And we have honored the children of Adam. Almighty God says in the Quran that all the children of Adam, irrespective whether they're black or white, male or female, whether they're born in UK or India or USA, whichever part of the world they belong to, Almighty God has honored all the children of Adam, all the human beings. And Islam does not only speak about universal brotherhood, it practically demonstrates that every Muslim who follows the religion of Islam should practically practice it minimum five times in the day. I'm talking about one of the pillars of Islam, that is Salah, which is the prayer. And a beloved prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him, said that when you stand for prayer, you should stand shoulder to shoulder. Irrespective whether the person standing next to you is black or white, rich or poor, king or pauper. When you stand for prayer, you have to stand shoulder to shoulder. This demonstrates the universal brotherhood every day, minimum five times every day. And another example is Hajj, which is one of the pillars of Islam, that every rich person who has the means and who has the health to travel to Mecca for the pilgrimage should at least do it once in his lifetime. And Hajj is the biggest annual gathering in the world, where about 3 to 4 million people from different parts of the world, from USA, from Canada, from UK, from India, from Malaysia, from different parts of the world, they gather together in one place in Makkah and Arafat and they are dressed in two pieces of unsewn cloth which is white in color. And all of them, you cannot identify the person standing next to you as king or a pauper. And all of them come on a common statement. Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Here we are, oh my Lord, here we are at your service. Islam practically demonstrates universal brotherhood. Many religions believe that humankind have been created from a single pair of Adam and Eve. May peace be upon them both. But there are some religion who put the blame only on Eve for the downfall of humanity, for the origin of sin. But if you read the Quran, the blame for disobeying Almighty God is equally put on both Adam and Eve. May peace be upon them. The Quran says in Surah Araf chapter 7, verse number 19 to 27, Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, they are both addressed more than a dozen times. Both of them, they disobeyed God. Both of them repented and both were forgiven. The blame is equally put on both of them. Never is, there is not a single verse in the Quran which put the blame only on Eve. However, there's one verse in the Quran in Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse 121, which says, and singles out Adam, peace be upon him, and says he disobeyed God. But on the whole, if you read the Quran, the blame is equally put on both of them. There are some religions who because they say that woman is the cause of the downfall of humanity, which Islam doesn't agree. Some religions say because of that, God punished her. 
and pregnancy is a curse and punishment of God on the woman. But in Islam, pregnancy uplifts the woman. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 1, respect the womb that bore you. The Quran says in Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14, we have enjoined on the human beings to be kind to the parents. In travail upon travail did the mother bore them, and in years twain was the weaning. The Quran repeats the message in Surah Aqaf, chapter number 46, verse number 15. We have enjoined on the human beings to be good to the parents. In pain did the mother bear them, and in pain did she give them birth. So pregnancy uplifts the woman, does not degrade her. And a beloved prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Sahih Bukhari is one of the collections of the authentic sayings of the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, in the book of manners, chapter number 2, hadith number 2, a man approaches the Prophet and asks him that who deserves the maximum companionship and love in this world? The Prophet said, your mother. The man asked after that who? The Prophet repeated, your mother. The man asked after that who? Again the Prophet said your mother. The man asked for the fourth time after that who? Then the Prophet said your father. That means 75%, three-fourths of the companionship goes to the mother, 25%, one-fourth goes to the father. In short, the mother gets the gold medal, she gets the silver medal, as well as the bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with the mere consolation prize. These are the teachings of Islam which we have to agree. And if we analyze, Islam gave economic rights to women 1300 years before the Western world. 1400 years ago, Islam gave right to any adult Muslim woman to own or disown the property without the permission of anyone else. The first time the Western world gave right for a woman to own or disown property was in 1870s under the Married Property, Married Woman Property Act, which said that a married woman, adult, can own or disown the property without the permission of the husband. And this act was later revised later on. Islam gave economic rights to women 1300 years before the Western world. And in Islam, we do not agree with the word housewife, which is used in English language, because we don't consider the woman to be married to the house, to be called a housewife. We prefer calling her as homemaker, the person who makes the home, the person who builds the home. Though we see that there are many misconceptions, we find, and many people think that men and women in Islam are not equal. In fact, in Islam, men and women are equal. But equality does not mean identicality. They're equal, but they are not identical. Depending upon the physiological makeup, their psychological makeup, their biological makeup, they have different roles. Overall, men and women are equal in some aspects. The woman, she may have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the men may have a degree of advantage. Let me give you an example. If there are two students in a class, student A and B, both of them, they come out first in examination. Both get 80 out of 100. When we analyze the answer sheet, the 10 questions, which have 10 answers, each carrying 10 marks. In answer to question number 1, student A gets 9 out of 10. Student B gets 9 out of 10. In answer to question number 2, student B gets 9 out of 10, and student A, he gets 7 out of 10. In all the remaining 8 answers, both get 8 out of 10. If we add up, both get 80 out of 100, they're equal. But in answer number one, the student A has a degree of advantage. In answer number two, student B has a degree of advantage. In the other aspects, both are equal. And overall also they're equal. In the same way, men and women in Islam are equal. In some aspects, the men have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the women have a degree of advantage. For example, if a robber, if a thief, enters my house. I will not say I believe in uh, woman liberalization. I will not ask my wife or my daughter to go and fight. Friend, it is my duty to fight. As the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 34, that God has given more strength to women. It is his duty to protect the woman. So in strength, the men have a degree of advantage. 
And the other example I gave earlier, that where companionship of the children is concerned for the parents, the women have three times more companionship as compared to men. The mother has three times more companionship as compared to father. So here, the women have a degree of advantage. So as I said earlier, men and women in Islam are equal. In some aspects, the women have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the men have a degree of advantage. The foundation of the religion of Islam is the belief in one and only sole creator and sustainer. And this creator and sustainer almighty God is the same for all the human beings. Only if you agree that our creator, sustainer and cherisher, one God is the same, then only can brotherhood be maintained in all religions. And this is the basis of all the religions. Religion, according to Oxford Dictionary, means a belief in a superhuman controlling power, a personal God or gods that deserve worship and obedience. So according to Oxford Dictionary, religion means belief in God. If you understand God, you understand that religion in the right perspective. Quran says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse number 64, Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That you worship none but one almighty God. So the Quran says, let the people of different religions come to common terms. What is different, we can discuss tomorrow. Let us agree to follow what is common. And one thing common in all the religion is to believe and worship only one God. To understand any religion or to understand the concept of God in a religion, it is not appropriate to try and observe the followers of that religion. Because many a time the followers themselves may not be aware about the religion or the concept of the God in religion. The best and the most authentic way of understanding a religion or understanding the concept of God in a religion is to try and understand what the authentic scriptures of that religion has to speak about God. Let's try and understand the concept of God in the major religions in the nutshell. First, we'll try and understand the concept of God in Hinduism. The two major and most authentic scriptures in the religion of Hinduism are the Vedas and the Upanishads. It's mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Ikkam evidityam. God is only one without a second. This is a Sanskrit quotation. It's mentioned in the Svetha Setar Upanishad, chapter number 6, verse number 9. Nacha se kasaj, janitana chadipa. Of that God, he has got no parents. He has got no Lord. He has got no father. He has got no mother. He has got no superior. It's mentioned in the Svetha Setar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19. As well as Yajur Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. Na tasyapati ma asti. Of that God, there is no Pratima. Pratima is a Sanskrit word which means, it means an image, a photograph, a painting, a picture, a sculpture, a statue, an idol. It says, of that God, there is no image, there is no picture, there is no painting, there is no portrait, there is no statue, there is no idol, there is no sculpture. And the Brahma Sutra of Hinduism, the fundamental creed of Hinduism is, Ekam Brahm Devutya Naste, Nena Naste Kinchan, Bhagwan Eki hai, Dusra Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Zara bhi Nahi hai. There is only one God, not a second one. Not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So if you read the Hindu scriptures, you shall understand the concept of God in Hinduism and understand Hinduism in the right perspective. Let's discuss the concept of God in Judaism. It's mentioned in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter number 6, verse number 4. Moses, peace be upon him, says, Shama Israelo. That your, O Lord, your Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 43, verse number 11. I, I am Lord, and there is no Savior besides me. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 45, verse number 5. I am Lord and there is none else, there is no God besides me. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 45, 
chapter number 46, verse number 9. I am God and there's none else. I am God and there's none like me. It's further mentioned in the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 2 to 5, as well as in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 9. Almighty God says, Thou shalt have no other God besides me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of anything, of any likeness in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, thy God, thy Lord, is a jealous God. So if you read the Old Testament, or if you read the Torah, you shall understand the concept of God in Judaism, and understand Judaism in the right perspective. Before we discuss the concept of God in Christianity, I would like to clarify a few points. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Almighty God. We believe he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Christians and the Muslims, we are going together. One may ask, then where is the parting of faith? The parting of faith is that many Christians believe, or most of the Christians believe, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. They believe that he was Almighty God. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement. There is not a single unambiguous statement. In the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John. Chapter number 14, verse number 28, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, My father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, My father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devil with the spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says, I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God, is a Muslim. As I mentioned, Muslim means a person who submits his will to God. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, not my will, but the will of Almighty God. So in Arabic we say he's Muslim. Therefore we say Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was one of the mightiest messengers of Almighty God. And he further clarified in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 24, he said that the words that you hear are not mine, but my Father's who has sent me. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 3, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, This is life eternal so that you may know one true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. It's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. It says, Amen of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by him and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by him and you are witness to it. And when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was asked, that which is the first of the commandment, he repeated verbatim what was said by Moses, peace be upon him, earlier. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Shama Israelo Adna Hainu Adna Ichad, which means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. So if you read the Bible, you shall understand the concept of God in Christianity and understand Christianity in the right perspective. Let's discuss the concept of God in Islam. The best reply that any Muslim can give you regarding the concept of God in Islam is quote to you Surah Ikhlas. That is chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Kul hu Allah ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allah hu samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yilid wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is begotten. Wa lam yakul law kufana. There is nothing like him. This is a four-line definition of Almighty God. Any person says so and so candidate is God. If he falls in, if he passes this four test, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting as God. The first is say he's one and only. The second is he should be absolute and eternal. The third, he begets not nor is he begotten. And fourth, that nothing like unto him anything in this world. This is a four-line definition of Almighty God, which we call as the litmus test for theology. 
it is the touchstone of theology. And further the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, that revile not, abuse not, those who they worship God besides Allah. Let, lest in the ignorance they will revile, they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran prohibits any Muslim from speaking bad, from reviling, from abusing those who other people worship God besides Allah. Lest in the ignorance they will abuse Allah. So to understand the concept of God in Islam, we have to read the Quran. Today, unfortunately, Islam is the most misunderstood religion in the world. The religion which has the maximum misconception in the world today, it is Islam. And one of the reasons for these misconceptions about this religion, I would say, it is the media. Today we find in the international media, there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam. We find in the international newspapers, in the international magazine, on the radio broadcast stations, on the internet satellite channels, on the internet, there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam. And the most misunderstood word regarding Islam, it is the word Jihad. It is not only misunderstood by the Muslims, because of the media, it's also misunderstood by the non-Muslims. Today, most of the people, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims, they think that any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for personal gain, whether it be for name, whether it be for fame, whether it be for honor, whether it be for land, any war fought by any Muslim is called as Jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim for any reason. Jihad comes from the Arabic word Jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. In the Islamic context, Jihad means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclination. Jihad also means to strive and struggle to make the society better. Jihad also means to strive and struggle against oppression. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in self-defense. So Jihad basically means to strive and struggle. For example, if a student is striving and struggling to pass in the examination, in Arabic we will say he is doing Jihad. So Jihad basically means to strive and struggle. Today, most of the Orientalists, they translate the word Jihad as holy war. If you translate holy war into Arabic, it is Harbu Muqaddasa. And this word Harbu Muqaddasa appears nowhere in the Quran, nowhere in any things of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This word holy war, if you go back into history, was first used for the Crusades. When the Crusaders, they forced people to accept the religion of Christianity by force. And unfortunately today, it is used for the Muslims and Islam. Quran mentions explicitly in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32. If anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. The Quran says, if any human being kills any other innocent human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And the verse continues, if anyone saves any human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though he has saved the whole of humanity. I, being a student of comparative religion, I have not come across any verse in any scripture besides the Quran, which is so explicit against terrorism, against killing innocent human being. It says that if any human being kills any other human being who is innocent, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And I have not come across any verse in any other scripture, any other religious scripture besides the Quran, which promotes the prevention of terrorism. And it says, if any human being saves any human life, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though you have saved the whole of humankind. Condemns all forms of terrorism. Islam condemns the killing of any, any innocent human being irrespective of caste, color, creed, irrespective of which nationality belongs to, irrespective of which religion it belongs to. Islam and I too condemn all forms of terrorism. I also condemn the 
which took place on 11th of September 2001, the Twin Tower bombing in New York, where few thousand innocent people were killed. I condemn the 7th 7, 7, 7th of July 2005 London bombing, where more than 50 innocent people were killed. I also condemn the serial train bomb blast that took place in Bombay on the 11th of July 2006, where more than 180 innocent people were killed. I also condemn the Gujarat massacre, the riots which were plea planned, which took place in Gujarat in India, where innocent few thousand Muslims were killed. I condemn all sorts of terrorism, where innocent human beings are killed, irrespective whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim. <clears throat> And whatever acts of terrorism which takes the life of innocent human being is to be condemned, including suicide bombing. Now we have recently in the few decades, past few decades, that a person goes, he puts up a bomb, goes in a marketplace, goes in a tube station in, on the road, and he blows himself up, and with him takes several other human lives. This act in no way, <clears throat> this act is not tolerable in any religion, especially Islam. Suicide bombing where innocent human beings are killed is totally prohibited in Islam. Unfortunately, though Islam is a religion which condemns all sorts of terrorism, all acts of terrorism that took place in the past, which is even taking place in this 21st century, even though it condemns, unfortunately, today, the media portrays Islam as a religion which promotes terrorism. Every community has its black sheep. Every community has its black sheep. And I'm also aware that there are black sheep in the Muslim community. What does the media do? The media picks up the black sheep of the Muslim community and they portray as though they are exemplary Muslims. Because of this today, we find that most of the people think that Islam promotes terrorism. If you read the Quran, if you read the sayings of the Prophet, Islam amongst all the religion is at the foremost in condemning the killing of innocent human beings. And one such prey of the media of these media tactics was myself. Eight months back, in the fourth week of June 2010, I was supposed to give a series of talk in UK. I was supposed to give a talk in the Wembley Arena, in Wembley, London, in LG Arena, NEC Birmingham, as well as Sheffield Arena in Sheffield. All these venues had a capacity of 10 to 15,000 people. And these are prestigious venues. Just three weeks before my lecture tour, there was an article which came in one of the leading newspapers at Sunday Times. Sunday Times, it gave an article, Muslim preacher of hate let into Britain. And this article, it gave portions of my speeches, which were either quoted out of context or they were misquoted. And it portrayed me as a preacher of hate, a person who promotes terrorism. And the next couple of days, the same article was picked up, rehashed and reprinted in many of the newspapers of UK. Not only newspapers of UK, but newspapers internationally, including the newspaper of India. Unfortunately, these articles inspired the Home Secretary of UK, Theresa May, to, to pass an exclusion order on the 16th of June 2010. After reading these articles and hearing some clips from the YouTube, which were again is out of context, and there were portions which were manipulated, based on these YouTube clips and the media report, the Home Secretary of UK on 16th of June 2010, she passed an exclusion order against me. And the next day, 17th of June, the Deputy High Commissioner of Britain in Bombay, on the 17th of June, 
they revoked and cancelled my visa. I had a valid five years multiple entry visa to UK, which was issued on the 15th of July 2008, valid till 15th of July 2013. I have been coming to UK since the past 20 years. I have come several times and for lecture tours several times. I had a valid multiple entry five years visa which had come twice before in 2008-2009 which was cancelled without giving me a fair hearing without giving me a fair hearing. I think this is an attack on freedom of expression as well as on human rights. Charles Farr, who is the Director General of the Office of Security and Counterterrorism, he was not in favor of this exclusion order. And he wanted me to reach to those Muslims who he felt the government could not reach. But the Home Secretary Ignoring the advice of her senior most security advisor, she went ahead with the exclusion order and later on, a few weeks later, she even suspended one of the advisors under Charles Farr who supported me. I personally have more faith in the judiciary system rather than the political system of my country, India, as well as the country of UK. We did a judicial review and took it to the High Court and Justice Cranston, though the Home Secretary said I have no right to file under human rights because I'm a non-UK citizen, Justice Cranston said and he reviewed it and he said that he can file a case and he passed a judgment and said that the first three decisions of the Home Secretary on 16th of June, 17th of June and the 27th of June, all three were unlawful. But however, later on in the month of August 2010, when they gave additional information, he said that this is lawful, which is not logical. I have faith in the judiciary system. We have filed for an appeal against the last judgment of the High Court. And I have full faith that inshallah, very shortly, this exclusion order would be reversed by the Court of Appeal. I hope in future I may have the chance to meet the Home Secretary Theresa May personally and explain to her the peaceful message of Islam and remove any misconception about Islam or any of my lecture that she may have. I personally would have come, I would have personally preferred to come personally in the Oxford Union and give this talk and have a lively question and session rather than the satellite. Last month, I had gone to France, I was in Paris. We had a board meeting of our trust, Islamic Foundation International, which is based in UK, as well as Universal Broadcast Limited. Because I could not come to UK, I called the board members to Paris, and I was shocked. Normally, the world feels that France is more strict against Islam than UK. But when I applied for visa, I got it within one hour. And we had the board meeting there. I prefer having it in UK, but because of the exclusion order, which I feel the Court of Appeal very shortly will reverse it. And though the world may think that because of the exclusion order, it is an attack on freedom of expression. But I'd look, I would like to thank the Oxford Union that even though an exclusion order has been passed on me, yet they permitted this debate or this lecture for the question answer session. I would like to thank the Oxford Union, especially the president, uh, Mr. James Langman, for being bold and agreeing to have this lecture. The Oxford Union may or may not agree with my speech. They may like my talk or may not like my talk. What I appreciate is that they are really people who promote freedom of expression. I would like to conclude my speech by giving a message. Peace is the only solution for the problems of humanity. Many nations, many countries have armies. They have got military, they have got navy, they have got air force. Some countries have weapons of mass destruction. Some have nuclear weapons. Believe me, all these are not the solution for the problems of humanity. 
the only solution according to me for the problems of humanity is peace. There may be differences. There are differences in culture. There are differences in languages. There are differences in color. There are differences of society. Irrespective of the differences, one common factor amongst all human beings of the world is that all want peace. According to me, peace is the only solution for the problems of humanity. <clears throat> I said at the starting of my talk, Islam is derived from the Arabic word Salam, which means peace. And this word Salam is mentioned in the Quran no less than 43 times. It's mentioned no less than 43 times. And along with its derivatives, it's mentioned no less than 143 times. Salam, peace, is mentioned in the Quran no less than 143 times. And I started my talk by greeting all of you, Assalamu Alaikum, which means peace be on all of you. The Quran says in Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 58, that peace is a salutation from the Lord who is the most merciful. One of the attributes of Almighty God is As-Salam, the source of peace. Quran says in Surah Al-Hashar, chapter 59, verse number 23, it refers to Allah, Almighty God, as As-Salam, the source of peace. Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 16, that Almighty God guides those people who come towards Him, towards peace and safety, and takes them out of darkness into light. That's the reason. Every chapter of the glorious Quran, there are 114 chapters in the Quran, every chapter except 9, starts with the beautiful formula, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, in the name of Allah, Almighty God, the most merciful, the most gracious. According to me, peace is the only solution for humanity. And I am a person who spreads peace. My mission is to spread peace. And as many may be aware, that... I started a global peace TV network about five years, before, five years before in January 2006. In January 2006, I launched the Peace TV in English. Two and a half years later in 2008, Peace TV Urdu. And inshallah, in the next couple of months, in April 2011, we will launch the Peace TV Bangla. Today, Peace TV English is the largest watched Islamic satellite channel in the world. It has a viewership of more than 100 million, out of which more than 25% are non-Muslim. Even if I'm able to convince one human being, irrespective whether he's a Muslim or non-Muslim, and prevent him from killing one innocent human being, I feel I would have saved the whole of humankind. Peace is the only solution. My message is only of peace. My mission is to spread peace. I would like to end my talk with the quotation of Dr. Adam Pearson. Dr. Adam Pearson said, People worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs. They fail to realize that the Islamic bomb, the bomb of peace, has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. Waakhru dawan alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Dr. Naik, thank you for coming here. We really do appreciate it. And thank you for your complimentary words of this union being a bastion of free speech. With that same principle of free speech in mind, don't you think that I or anyone should therefore have the right to go to a Muslim country and proclaim the Christian gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God? Brother asked the question, with the same right of freedom of speech, doesn't he have the right to proclaim the Christian Bible in any Muslim country? Brother, as we know today, all the Muslim countries per se 
do not follow Quran and the Hadith in the true sense. There are many Muslim countries, some may be close to Islam, some may not be close to Islam. Depending upon each country, they may have their own law. So what you have to do, you have to ask that particular country which does not permit you to preach your gospel, what is the reason that they don't want to preach your gospel? Don't tonight, thank you very much for your talk. The question I have is you profess to be a man of peace. You've spoken very eloquently about the idea of peace in Islam. Peace is written in front of your microphone as you stand there. And I agree with you in, in many senses. But my question is why then is your message still seen as so controversial? Why are there figures within the Islamic world, why are there fellow Islamic clerics who see your message and still believe that you are wrong? Why, I mean, you, you've claimed that the Home Secretary has banned you from this country because of a, a sort of media conspiracy, but why is there a broader sense of discontent with your message? The brother asked a very good question, that why if I'm a man of peace, and I speak about peace, some people are against me, some Muslim, some non-Muslim, the Home Secretary, brother, you have to understand that any person who's popular, they are bound to be people who are against him, irrespective whether the popular person is doing good work or bad work. And the best example I can give you, that today, according to Michael H. Hart, he wrote a book saying, the 100 most influential people in the world history. Though he's a Christian, he put number one most influential human being as Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Today, do you know? Though Muslims consider him to be the most important and the most influential person in history, there are many non-Muslims who think the same. But today if we analyze the maximum books written against any human being on the face of the earth, it is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The second person he named in his list was Isaac Newton, but because he's not a common man for common human being, he's a scientist. The third person on his list was Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. If we analyze today, the second person in human history who has maximum books written against him, it is Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Based on this argument, do I have to agree that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him, they were not good? What we have to realize, when a person gets popular, there are bound to be people against him. And according to the Home Department of UK, when I had come in the year 2009, I was informed by reliable sources that according to the Home Department of UK, the most popular Islamic satellite channel in the world is Peace TV and the most watched Islamic satellite channel in UK is also Peace TV. Not only is it watched by Muslims, but even watched by non-Muslims. The same report said that the most popular Islamic speaker in the world is Dr. Zakir Naik and the most popular Islamic speaker in UK is also Dr. Naik. That's the reason the Home Department was requesting me that can I reach out to those Muslims which the UK government cannot. But now because of the change of government, what I feel it was more of a political move rather than a legal move. And as maybe they wanted someone popular so that they could pass the message that we are tough against Muslims, and that is the reason what we feel that we have more faith in the judicial system rather than the political system. I think it was mainly because of popularity and it was mainly a political move rather than a legal move. And inshallah, God willing, we feel that this exclusion order would be reversed by the Court of Appeal, hopefully. Thank you. Uh, Milias Palaeus, my name, I'm a, I'm a lawyer, a historian, and also a theologian. You gave a very excellent exposition of uh, the Quran and Islam, but uh, 
Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are all Abrahamic faiths. A Jew could have said the same thing, or there's almost the same things that we said, by quoting uh, the Quran. Sorry, it's called quoting the, the Torah and the Talmud. A Christian could have said almost everything you said by quoting both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I do not know whether we should be trying to say one religion is superior or more truthful than another. And if we do go down that line, what does that lead to? Uh, that's what led to the Crusades, etc. You mentioned about justice and peace. Of course, the Christian Bible mentions more there are more verses about justice and peace than there are about the Holy, Holy Spirit. And of course, Christians were pacifists until 313. So, what is the difference between what you are saying and Judaism and Christianity? And what would that lead to? But after a good question, and I do agree with him that if you read the Torah, the books of Judaism, the books of Christianity, you will find verses of peace. Never in my lecture ever did I say that any religion is against peace or any religion is in favor of terrorism. I always said all religions are against terrorism. What I made one statement in my speech that the verse of the Quran chapter 5 verse number 32, this verse which is so emphatic, I do not find a similar verse in any of the scripture because I'm a student of comparative religion saying that if you kill one innocent human being it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity and if you save one innocent human being it is as though you have saved the whole of humanity it was only one verse so that generally I do agree that most of the religion almost all they speak about peace that's the reason Jesus Christ peace be upon him if you read the gospel of Luke chapter number 24 verse number 36 when he goes to the upper room, he says, when he wishes apostle, Shalom Alaikum, which means same, peace be upon you in Hebrew. So the greetings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him too, when he met the people was Shalom Alaikum, which meant same in Arabic, Assalamu Alaikum, may peace be on you. Regarding you saying that one religion superior to the other religion, I believe Almighty God sent only one religion. He has not sent different religions. What the Quran says, he has made human beings into different tribes, different colors, different languages, so that they may recognize each other, not they may despise each other. The only religion that God has sent to all his messengers, whether it be Moses, whether it be Jesus, peace be upon him, Moses, peace be upon him, Muhammad, peace be upon him, it was to submit their will to Almighty God. I believe all these messengers, right from Adam, Noah, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. All of them brought the same message that believe in one God and worship him alone and only him and submit your will to that almighty God. Hope that answers the question. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Izzy Westbury. I'm the secretary here at the Oxford Union. I have a very short question to ask. Um, you talk about the hijab being something that serves to protect a woman. Surely it's, it's extremely patronizing and degrading to prevent a woman from making that decision for herself. How could you answer that? What's the question, sister? Can you repeat the question? I said, in your speech, you talk about the hijab being something that serves to protect a woman. But how is it not extremely patronizing and degrading and not allowing a woman to make that decision herself? Sister, I pose a very good question that when I say that hijab is required for women, isn't it not degrading for the woman to patronize it? Isn't it uh, degrading? If you read the Quran, the Quran and Islam has prescribed hijab. That means the woman should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. This is for the modesty. And it is not only mentioned in the Quran, it is also mentioned in the Bible. If you read the Bible, 
in the first Timothy chapter number two verse number nine it says that women should be dressed up with shamefacedness they should be dressed up with sobriety and should not wear braided hair or of gold or pearls it's further mentioned in the first Corinthians chapter number five verse number seven to eleven the woman that does not cover a hair head then she dishonors a head a head should be shaved off anyway I don't agree with this I'm just quoting you from the Bible same way if you go to the Vedas it says that the woman should cover the head so all the religious scriptures they talk about the woman covering there it is for modesty it is not to degrade the woman and if you analyze there was allegation made against me saying that Dr. Zakir Naik says that uh, that if they don't wear hijab you know that if you wear Western clothes there are chances the women will be raped it is a misquotation again what I said that if women were revealing clothes they have more chances of being raped what I was doing the same newspaper Sunday time which spoke against me one year before on the March of 9th 2009 Sunday Times carried an article in Britain one out of seven feel that the woman who were sexy revealing clothes she should be hit I'm sorry I don't agree with it this is the statistics that was given in the Sunday Times on the 9th of March 2009 that in Britain one out of seven Britishers believe that the woman who were revealing and sexy clothes should be hit I disagree with this furthermore one more article came in 2005 in the same newspaper Sunday Times it said that 26 percent of the Britishers they feel that wearing revealing clothes is partially or totally responsible for the rape so what I say that the more modest you are dressed up you are respected more so Islam has prescribed the modest hijab for the woman not to degrade her but to uplift her I do agree there may be cultural differences Islam cannot force anyone to adopt it there are cultural differences for example I'll give you an example that some some societies what they feel that even looking at a woman is immodest some societies feel looking is no problem but touching a woman is immodest some of the society feels shaking hand is no problem some societies feel kissing no problem some societies feel doing anything as long as both agree is no problem different societies and different cultures have got different rules and regulation when I went to America while I was giving a talk one of the American told me you Eastern woman you I'm modest I was shocked so I said why do you call the Eastern woman immodest he told me you Eastern woman you expose your belly so in American Western country exposing belly is immodesty in India exposing belly is not immodesty wearing shorts is immodesty so what if you realize sister there's different culture there's different system Islam cannot force anyone to adopt it's clearly mentioned in the Quran in Surah Baqarah chapter chapter number 2 verse number 256 like Rafiddin there is no compulsion religion but if some women want to adopt the hijab because they feel modest and they feel respected I feel no other woman should disagree and when I've been to UK I've seen hundreds and thousands of women who do cover their hair and who feel that they are uplifted because of this modesty hope that answers the question <coughs> My name is Dr. Ramsey from Oxford, uh, Ambassador of the World Universal Peace Federation, and member of the, one of the members of the Muslim Council of Britain. I would like to say you are doing an excellent job. God bless you. Now my question, Dr. Zakhanari, in your opinion, is Islamophobia a real ph phenomenon and if so how do you suggest it can be tackled does the responsibility lies with the Muslim community or should Western society be doing more uh, to breach this barrier of fear I'm talking about the fear all phobias are fear fear of unknown Thank you. The brother asked a very good question that is Islamophobia a real phenomena? How should it be tackled? Is it the responsibility of the Muslim community to do it? 
yes there is islamophobia especially in this 21st century and as i mentioned in my speech i believe one of the major reason for this islamophobia is the media and i said in my speech that the media spreads several misconceptions about this religion of islam i do agree it is the duty of us muslims that we should spread the true teachings of islam i'm aware that there are black sheep in the muslim community i'm not saying all muslims are 100 percent pious all are good there are black sheep in every community including islam what does the media do they pick up the black sheep of the muslim community and they portray on the media as though they're exemplary muslims what we have to do is we have to portray the right teachings of quran and the sayings of the prophet muhammad peace be upon him and if any muslim is involved in doing acts which are against the religion of islam which uh, which are acts of terrorism killing of innocent human being it is the duty of us muslims that we should tell such people it is haram there are some people who are being misguided and they have been brainwashed into saying that killing innocent human being is part of islam you will get reward it's our duty as the mainstream Muslims to try and convey the right message of Islam and prevent such Muslims from being misguided. That's point number one. Point number two, it's our duty to tell the government of the country where you're living that Islam is a peaceful religion. And what I believe that Muslims should be part of the solution, they should not be part of the problem. The government should not think that Muslims are part of the problem they should think Muslims are part of the solution <clears throat> and that's the advice I even give to the police of India and the police of Bombay and I interact with the police force very often and I tell them that just for a few you should take the Muslims in confidence and the best is to have an interaction I have addressed many many police officers from very different countries and we should try and have a question and succession and remove the misconception in their mind and prove to them that Islam is the one of the most tolerant religion. It's a peaceful religion. And if you know the teaching of Islam, surely the least person that, that you'll have to fear is fear a true Muslim. I'm not talking about the black sheep of the Muslim community. Hope that answers the question. I'm Yasmin, I'm a student at the university, and my question is sort of related to the last question. Um, you talked about you wanted to come to the UK because you wanted to reach out to Muslims who you felt that the government were not able to reach out to. And I wondered why, in your opinion, you felt that the government were failing in this way to reach out to Muslims in Britain. Just as a question that I wanted to come to UK to reach out to those Muslim who the government could not reach out. Sister, there's a slight confusion. <clears throat> I said, Charles Farr, the Director General of the Office of Security and Counterterrorism, felt that I could reach out to those Muslims who the government could not reach out to. He felt that, not me. And I think, again, because of the information which the Home Department has, that Peace TV is the most popular Islamic satellite channel in UK, watched by the Muslims as well as the non-Muslim, and the most popular speaker, according to the Home Department, not according to me, according to the Home Department is Dr. Zakir Naik. So I, I repeated what he thought. He thought that I could reach better. Maybe he thinks that my speeches have influenced, and he may have read my speeches in context. That's the reason he was not in favor of the Home Secretary that she passed the exclusion order. Hope that answers the question. Do you think that he has a point? Do you think that, um, in some sense, the government are failing to reach out to Muslims? Yes. If you ask my opinion, that do I agree with the thoughts of Charles Farr that the government is failing? Or yes, I do agree with him. 
I do agree because as I said in my earlier answer that the government should not think that Muslims are part of the problem. The government should think that Muslims are part of the solution because a Muslim there are many Muslims who are British citizens and it is the duty of every Muslim to follow all the laws of the country staying in as long as the law does not force him to do something which is private in the religion or prevents him from doing something which is compulsory in religion. As far as India is concerned, I do not know of any rule or any law in the constitution which forces a Muslim in India to do something which is prohibited neither does it prevent me from doing something which is compulsory so I am a practicing Muslim and I'm proud to be an Indian so I'm proud to be an Indian Muslim similarly there are many Britishers who I feel may be feeling the same they may be Muslims and they may be following the laws of the country so they're British Muslims so I feel that the government should take in confidence and what they should do that they should see to it that this maligning by the media should stop and the best example, best example is myself. I mean, there are many, there are 100 million viewers of Peace TV. And there are millions of people who, who tell that I am the ambassador for peace. They say I am a peaceful person. There are many heads of states of several foreign countries, many. They have called me as the state guest. So do you mean to say all these state guests of several countries, the president, the prime minister, the king, the sheikh, they meet me, they have dinner. Do you mean to say they're meeting a person who is promoting terrorism, a person who spreads hate? So what I'm saying that this is all again manipulated by the media. So the government should not fall prey to the media and take any decision hastily. What they should do, they should give a chance for the person to clarify. And then I'm sure that most of the misconception will be removed and I'm sure that UK would be a more peaceful country to live in. Hope that answers the question. Dr. Matt Knight, hello and thank you. Uh, my name is John, I'm a doctoral student here at Oxford and I'm from the USA. My question has to do with persecution, specifically how former Muslims are sometimes killed if they have chosen to leave Islam, uh, deciding that another religion is more true. For example, my girlfriend is Turkish and she lives in Turkey. She used to be Muslim, but decided to become a Christian after understanding Jesus in, in a new way as God made flesh. She has had fears in the past that she may be harmed or even killed for her decision. In light of the recent attention to this matter in Pakistan uh, with Miss Bibi and the blasphemy laws, my question is this. What are you doing or what do you plan to do to educate Muslims that if someone chooses to leave Islam, that person should not be killed? Well, that's a very important question. And he said that what if a person who's practicing Islamic faith changes to any other faith? Is it required that he should be killed? And all these articles that came about me, a preacher of hate, one of the point was that Dr. Zakir prescribes death penalty for those Muslims who leave their faith and they profess any other faith. Again, these reports were out of context. They took up a portion of my speech where I said that many scholars say that a Muslim who leaves this faith and professes any other religion, death penalty, the punishment. But I went on to further say that death penalty is not a standard punishment for any Muslim who leaves this faith and professes any other religion. I gave the example. That one during the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, there was a Muslim who converted to another faith and had done some wrong deed for which the Prophet had told they should be put to death. But later on, when Hazrat Usman, may Allah be pleased with him, he approached the Prophet and said that the man should be forgiven. The Prophet pardoned him. 
This incident proves that death penalty is not the standard rule for any Muslim who changes his faith. If he does some act which requires to be punished by death, depending upon the act he has done. But according to Islam and according to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon, according to me, death penalty is not the standard rule for any Muslim who changes his faith and professes any other religion. And that's what I've told in my talks. But unfortunately what they do, they pick up a portion of my speech from the YouTube and they show it to the Home Secretary and the Home Secretary believes it. What you have to see is in context. I don't give any... Uh, one more example I'd like to give that the moment I was banned in UK I was supposed to travel to Toronto Canada immediately when the ban was effected even my visa for Canada was cancelled they also had a five-year visa and I heard on the Toronto news it says here the speaker of the the preacher of hate hear what he says and then they show my clipping that when you beat your wife don't beat on the face point number one when you beat, you should not leave a mark on the body. Finish. Now they are showing a clipping, a portion of my answer. Anyone who hears these two statements, when you beat your wife, don't beat on the face. When you beat, you do not leave a mark on the body. It will, a person would think that Zakir is showing how to beat your wife without leaving a mark. It was a portion of my answer when a non-Muslim asked the question that doesn't the Quran say, that you should be to your wife and I said the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter number 4 verse number 34 it says that when your wife is disloyal to you first you admonish her point number one admonish her first then you stop talking to her then stop sharing her bed then you can beat her lightly the Arabic word is Daraba and when someone asked Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, the companion of the Prophet, he said it means like beating with a toothbrush. And further the commentary says, so the Prophet said, when you beat your wife, you should not beat on the face, point number one. Beat her in such a way that there's no mark left on the body. So this part was shown and I continued. Islam and Quran never suggest wife bashing. It means you should beat with the toothbrush lightly. In modern terminology, I said beating with a handkerchief. Just a symbolic beating, such that you don't beat on the face, even a symbolic beating, and don't beat in a way in which there's no mark left on the body. That means it's an admonition. It's just a symbolic beating. So they cut off all the portion and show only two sentences of mine, and they promote that Zakir is a person who's against women. So these things were also done regarding the death penalty for a person who changes the faith from Islam but as I told you in Islam the standard rule is not death penalty for a Muslim who changes his faith to any other religion hope that answers the question continue to educate people so that Muslims around the world know that brother this I have mentioned in several of my speeches now when you ask the question I give the reply there are tens of millions of people watching this program on Peace TV. They are being educated that death penalty is not the standard rule. But why will they believe in me? Because I've given the reference. I gave the reference of the sayings of the Prophet from Abu Dawood. I'm giving the reference for more authenticity. Abu Dawood, volume number three, hadith number four, three, four, five. Now, when I'm giving reference, Abu Dawood, volume number three, hadith number four, three, four, five, anyone can go and check up. In this hadith, the sayings of the Prophet, the Prophet pardoned the person who was a Muslim and changed to another faith. Now the difference between my answer and the other answers are, the other people just say without giving reference. Now when I give a reference, sayings of the Prophet, Abu Dawud, poem number 3, hadith number 4345, you can go and check up. So this gives more authenticity and I'm sure now there are millions of Muslims who will agree that death penalty is not the standard rule for any Muslim who changes his faith to any other religion. Hope that answers the question. This evening, due to the limitation of the satellite link. However, I would ask you now to join with me in thanking Dr. Knight for his speech and pass it back to Peace TV to finish the evening. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I remain James Sangman and your president. Thank you.
I would like to thank the Oxford Union, especially the president of the Oxford Union, Mr. James Langman, for making this event possible. And I really appreciate with the way they invited me for this talk. And at least now, the people of UK can really see a live telecast that I'm a person who gives the message of peace. In a live telecast, there is no editing. There is no manipulation. You can have more faith in these live telecasts rather than clippings from YouTube, which can be manipulated. I would like to thank the members of the Oxford Union once again. And I hope very shortly, once the explosion order is reversed, I would like to personally come to the Oxford Union and meet the members of the Oxford Union. Thank you very much. For the viewers of Peace TV, may I just give a background briefing for those who have joined in later on. We just heard before us a very enlightening talk by Dr. Zakir Naik addressing the Oxford Union UK on the topic Islam and the 21st century. This was an opportunity to present not only to UK and the people of United Kingdom, but at the global level, because Oxford Union is not merely famous for presenting the views or concerns at the Oxford University itself, but on a wider level throughout the world of issues which are of global concern. Today we have Islam being analyzed, being criticized, being appreciated. It is in the forefront of being understood, sometimes for the right reasons, sometimes for the right, wrong reasons. Today, the Oxford Union has provided us this opportunity to put before the world the views of what Islam stands for through the person of Dr. Zakir Naik, one of the leading orators on Islam and comparative religion in the world. And it's a pleasure that we could hear the different questions and viewpoints. And inshallah, we hope to have such programs in other places on the world where opportunities could be availed of and spread the message of peace further and further to every corner of the world, inshallah. We thank all of you all for being with us and sharing these historic moments of this unique debate at the Oxford Union. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.